Well, praise the Lord, folks. This is Pastor Charles. I am speaking to you at the moment from Huntsville, Alabama. And I have some uh, good news that I'm going to share with you in a moment. But let me start out by explaining. Um, we were not able to have church today. Tommy and I have been in Huntsville since um, Monday evening. We had to drive up here to do some business, getting ready for him to start his new job um, the 13th of February. We wanted to get a house shopped and possibly, you know, an offer put in and what have you uh, so we could get the ball rolling toward a closing before uh, he is to start his job. And uh, thank God by Friday, we found a property, as I shared on Facebook and everything, that has both uh, a home on it, a three-bedroom, two-bath, good-sized, good-square-footage house, big house, nice house. And it also has a 2,000-something square foot building uh, on the property that is closer to the road, has parking area there near it, has an office in it, and my hair looks terrible, I apologize, has an office in it and a bathroom, which most of the properties we looked at that had buildings, the building did not have a bathroom. Uh, this property that we found, the building actually was plumbed and had a bathroom. It also has a water spigot where we're planning on putting the platform, so we'll be able to install a baptistry. And that excites me as well. I mean, this place is just set up. You know, it's it's ready for us to go in and build a small church out of it. Um, the sanctuary will probably accommodate, I'm estimating, um, between 40 and 60 people. I would estimate 40 to 60 people probably fairly easily. And um, it's going to look nice. The building will look nice. You know, it's got vinyl siding on it. We've got to frame in a couple of uh, large overhead garage style doors. Uh, that's not hard to do. I can actually do that work myself. And uh, But we're, we need to do a little bit of remodel on the interior. You know, there's some work on the interior we're going to have to do to make it look a little more churchy, you know, clean it up a little bit. Because it was basically a... I think maybe uh, some sort of an auto shop or an artist studio or something, you know. Uh, the walls are a little rough, you know. Um, so we're going to put up some sort of siding, you know, make it look nice and clean and everything. Uh, the news I have today is this. Uh, uh, we actually received a few moments ago the counteroffer from the owner, the seller of our the property we're interested in, we put in an offer. I told the realtor, I told Tommy, I said, I am lowballing the seller, meaning I'm offering way less, a very low price. And I said, the reason that I'm doing this, I'm a businessman and I'm a negotiator. The reason I'm doing this is I have a number in my mind that I'm willing to go to. And uh, I said, but if you start at that number, then the, the seller's going to come back at a higher number. So you always want to go lower than where you really want to be. So I went $10,000 lower than where I wanted to be. And then I'm saying, okay, Lord, it's in your hands because uh, I only want the seller to come up 10000 Mind you. I was offering $30,000 under the asking price. And I was saying, Lord, I only want him to come up as much as $10,000. That's it. I don't want him to come up any more than $10,000, which would make it, we'd be buying the property for $20,000 under the asking price. Well, I got our counter offer. The realtor texted me on the phone. He said, check your email. I just sent you the counteroffer. I opened the counteroffer and I read it. 
And honey, I wanted to shout every, every which way, but upside down. Uh, I, I've never been so happy in my life. It was exactly at the number that I was willing to go for. That's the number I wanted, exactly the number I wanted. And so, I mean, without having to go back and forth, you know, counter countering and all this, it was one offer, one counter offer, and boom, we were right there at the at the number. So we will be accepting that counter offer. And that means that Tommy and I will have a new home. Hallelujah. Here, here in the Huntsville area. And we'll have a church. <clears throat> we'll have a place for the ministry to be. And unlike Dallas, where we met in places over the years, Whoa, folks, you have no idea what we went through in Dallas. You have no idea. We met in some places. We met in, mo in a motel meeting room and had the room broken into and our all of our camera equipment and our laptops and everything stolen. And the motel to this day, it's never tried to recompense us for that in any way. I contacted the uh, the parent company about it. They just said, well, you just have to deal with the local motel. Well, the local motel could care less. They're, they're not going to do anything about it. So we lost tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment that day. Uh, so obviously then at that point, that's when we first moved to my house. That's when we just, okay, we got to do something different, you know, and we turned our sunroom into a little sanctuary that could accommodate about 25 people or so, you know. And um, we've met in places in Dallas uh, where obviously we didn't know this going in, but uh, we rented a building at one point on Maple Avenue in Dallas, and it was right there in Oak Lawn. And actually, we did pretty well there as far as people coming out and attending and checking us out. We did fairly well. Um, but every time it rained, we wound up with two to three inches of water on the floor of the building, literally. So we had to leave that. Uh, we met places uh, and had unscrupulous landlords. Our church got done real dirty by one landlord in one building, we at least. And this particular landlord was a Dallas City Councilman. And when I talked to the voice, the Dallas Voice, which is the LGBT paper in the area, they actually turned around and burned us by making it look like we didn't have the money to pay the rent. And that's why this all happened. And when I talked to the voice, I was so mad. When I talked to the voice about it, the guy that did the article, he said, well, you know, we can't afford to lose our access to City Hall and everything, you know. And if we came down too hard on this guy, we might wind up messing up our access to City Hall. So in other words, an LGBT publication turned around and burned one of our its own community members and at that time, our church had only been in Dallas like maybe a total of uh, two and a half, three years or so. And so anyway, you know, we went through a lot in Dallas and we wound up having to meet in one location. Then after a couple of years or months, whatever it was, we'd have to move to a new location. We were never able to establish a permanent physical identity. And when you're establishing a church, especially when you spend 20 years in a town, you really need a permanent physical identity. When you say the name of the church, people need to kind of in their mind be able to picture a place. You know, the church is the people. It's not the building. The building's a meeting hall. It's not the church. But in modern terminology, we refer to the building as the church. So anyway, we never were able to establish a permanent residence anywhere physically. <clears throat> so, as we were looking at the possibility of relocating, I told Tommy, I said, I feel the Lord just really speaking to me about doing several things different, many things different uh, in our next work. And this really isn't a new ministry. This is the... We're simply, in essence, moving our ministry to a new location. 
But in the process of starting it here, we're giving it a new name. And I guess now I can go ahead and tell you all this good news. Our new ministry will be known as Forward Christian Life Center. Forward Christian Life Center. And I'll be sharing with you our new logo and our new signage uh uh, you know, stuff like that in the very near future. I've already created all this. When Tommy knew uh, he had lost his job and we knew that we were likely going to have to relocate the ministry and everything, I told you that follow us, you know, I created a website months and months and months ago for the new church. It's already up and running. I've been meeting people here in town who are interested in our ministry, LGBT people. And I've been able to give them the website address because we already had a website up and running. We already have face group, Facebook groups and pages up and running. We already have a YouTube channel created under the name Forward Christian Life Center that is up and running. Um, we already have TikTok under that name. We already have uh, a, a number of, of different, th I can't even remember them all, but we've got a number of things already established with that name, with our logo, with our, you know, our uh, signage, whatever you want to call it. The internet has already got all this stuff out there. Now all we have to do is start uh, putting in the information as to meeting location and what have you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that in today. I'll be online and I'll be putting that in because we now know the address of where the church will be. And um, I've been wanting to live in the country. I do not like living in a city. I, I really don't. Um, where Tommy and I lived for the last almost 10 years, we had one set of neighbors on one side of us. Honestly, the woman especially, not even the man, I, I, I can honestly say, he and I, when he and I would talk in general, we got along famously, we got along very well. <clears throat> but his wife was one of the most negative, grumpy, I don't even know how to describe her, just a horrible person to deal with every time I even laid eyes on her. If she was stepping out in the yard or something, I knew immediately she was going to be coming over to me and griping about something. And uh, I could, if I mowed two inches too far into their yards, according to her, because I really didn't know exactly where the property line was, but according to her, she said where the property line was, according to her. And uh, if I mowed two inches over into the, she was complaining, literally, which I cannot for the life of me understand because, you know, two inches or I don't care if somebody mows 10 inches into my yard, it's not going to kill the yard, so I don't care. But anyway, she'd gripe and groan, gripe and groan, gripe and groan. She griped about uh, foliage on the side of the house at one point between their property and ours on our side of the house, you know. And uh, I invested thousands of dollars and went in and created a, a garden area there uh, that was low, almost no maintenance. I had some rose bushes plant. I planted some rose bushes, did all the work myself, planted rose bushes, put down uh, landscape fabric so the grass wouldn't grow, you know, and all this, uh, put in some crushed stone and everything so that that way she couldn't complain because there was nothing there. There was no grass or weeds to grow or anything. And um, so that, you know, I did that because she griped and griped and griped and it got on my last nerve. So I said, okay, I'll fix it so that there ain't nothing going to happen over there that she can gripe about. Then I turned around and I actually built out a flower bed that come down the property line, literally on our property line, all the way down to the road and planted some bushes in there and put stone in there to match what we have around the house, you know, including on the one side of the house. <sighs> All so that I could prevent this lady from griping and groaning. And uh, do you know those people wouldn't even take the edger and edge along 
the other side of the flower bed that I created to, to mark the property line delineation. Because according to them, the property line was an inch or two from where I had put the uh, edge, the edging, you know, for the flower bed. I mean, just craziness, absolute craziness. And I'm so tired of living in the city. I'm, I'm tired of living so close to people. The way I say it sometimes is you comb your hair and they feel the comb, you know. Uh, I don't like living on top of people like that. Never have. I grew up in New England. I grew up in a very, very small town. My father always had at least an acre of land. And I just don't like living all close to people and, you know, and stuff. And, uh, you know, you sneeze and this neighbor says, God bless you. You know, I don't want that. So, um, I've been praying and asking the Lord, Lord, let us, let us get some space out in the country where we can have at least an acre, at least one acre. And we come up here to Huntsville and we found a number of property, not just one. We found, oh my goodness, probably eight different ones that had buildings on them um, that could easily be turned into worship space for the church so we could start the church there. Now, once the church gets established and going and all that, we may move it into Huntsville proper, you know. Uh, but for now, it's in the outskirts of Huntsville and one of the uh, suburbs of Huntsville. And, um, so I said, Lord, you know, let us get in the country a little bit and, and, and please let us have some land and, you know, and I said, if we could get a property that has a building that we can easily convert into a church space, that would be fantastic because that way we will have a space dedicated to the church, specifically for the church. And I can go in there anytime, any day I want to and pray, which let me tell you, I love to do. And we can have church there and we can be there. If it takes the church, God help us, I hope not. But if it takes the church 10 years to grow uh, like it, you know, like it has been all these years that I've been in affirming ministry, it has not for one minute been easy. It has not for one second been fast growing. Um, when I was pastoring in the mainstream, I've shared with people over the years, and I know I'm repeating myself. Um, when I was pastoring in the mainstream, my churches were very, very fast growing. We would go from literally, you know, three or four people in the first service service maybe or six people or eight people in the first service and literally within six months we were running 40 or 50 people um that was how my ministry was in the first three churches that i started over the years and all three of them were so-called mainstream when i came out and i came into affirming ministry <clears throat> and i acknowledge folks i acknowledge I didn't know what I was doing. When I came into affirming ministry, I had no clue what I was doing. Um, I didn't understand LGBT people's uh, trepidation of churches and their, you know, and their feelings about church. I thought, you know, if a Pentecostal a church were to open and be affirming and welcoming of LGBT people, I thought people would flood into the building. They'd be so thrilled. Mainly because I know that had that been the case for me, I would have, you know. So that's what I expected to happen. I really did. And boy, I started in New York, and I only started my, my first uh, affirming work in New York City because I lived there at the moment. Um, I really, I didn't even want to start a church in New York City, to be honest with you. Um I had no intention, honestly, of staying in New York City permanently. I, you know, I didn't plan on living there forever, so I didn't want to really start an affirming work there. But long story short, I wound up doing that, and I wound up being there doing an affirming work in the city for like almost seven years. And then I went back to my home state of Connecticut for about a year, year and a half. And while I was in Connecticut, I was still going back to New York City every week during the week. 
and conducting a Bible study at the LGBT Community Center in New York City because I didn't want, I, I hate feeling like a failure. I hate walking away from something and feeling as though I failed. I don't care what I set my hand to. I don't like feeling like a failure, okay? And honestly, when I left New York City, we could not, for the love of God, we could not get people to be faithful and consistent in their attendance. We absolutely could not get people to give in support of the ministry. My one friend that I met in New York, been it's been 25 years ago now or better, uh, he was our primary support all these years. And if it wasn't for him, I couldn't have done half of what we did over the last 25 years. And um, so, you know, uh, if it hadn't been for Claude and him supporting the work I was doing, and he was not a member of our church. He's not even Pentecostal. Uh, he's a gay Baptist man, um, black Baptist man. And But he visited our church one Sunday, and he said, if I don't attend your church, I feel like I'd like to still support your ministry because I think what you're doing is wonderful, and I think it's necessary. And I said, I didn't know what to say, because to be honest, I never had anybody say that to me before. But I said, well, I, you know, I, I get, I don't see where that wouldn't be, you know, acceptable. If you want to support the work we're doing, by all means, you know. And I, I honestly didn't expect his support to be anything spectacular or wonderful. I had, I didn't know anything about the man, knew nothing. Turns out that he was a, um, a CPA for the city of New York. He worked as uh, part of the government of the city of New York. He had worked there for decades, made a superb living, uh, lived in a house he inherited from his mom and dad. He didn't have to, he never had to make a house payment in his life. All he had to do was pay taxes and insurance. And uh, so long story short, you know, he was fairly well to do. And uh, he has been extremely supportive of my ministry now for all these years. And um, and I am so grateful for this man, I'll tell you. So anyway, so, you know, I was in New York for all those years, and we were never able to get people to be consistent. We were never able to get people to be supportive. Finally, around, uh, uh, well, it was actually the very, very beginning of the year 2000, I moved out of New York City and I moved back to my home state of Connecticut and we started to work in New Haven, Connecticut. And there were a few fellows that came. We actually had about three or four guys who came and were consistent. I will give credit to these men. They were consistent and they supported the church. They, they came, they supported it, you know, all that sort of thing. And, um, uh, unfortunately, whoops, sorry, we wound up going through some trouble there too because at one point we rented out a storefront building and uh, all signs indicate that the town that we were in, it was just outside of New Haven, um, found out what kind of ministry we were and all of a sudden they literally came and they reneged on our certificate of occupancy and issued a cease and desist. We couldn't uh, have our church there anymore. So that kind of left us high and dry. Then we turned around, we started meeting at a local Episcopal church and uh, the Episcopal priest was a woman actually. And she was a, a lovely lady, very nice lady. God, I've always, you know, I get along with people. I don't care how far apart we are in our doctrine and in our beliefs. I respect them. I honor them. I appreciate them for who they are. I appreciate where they're at and their walk with God. And so, I mean, I always have gotten along with others of other faiths and what have you. And she and I got along famously. The only problem is uh, when she heard what the city had done to us, she came along and said, well, you know, y'all can meet in our our church, you know, and, we'll, you know, and I forget what time we came in, you know, and all that. 
But unfortunately, within a matter of a week or two, literally, she began to, well, do you all think you could just cut your service a little shorter, you know? Because she asked me initially, like, how much time we might need. And I told her, I said, well, we're Pentecostal. I said, we, you know, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to uh, say any less than two hours. You know, I said, well, we're going to need two hours. And so at first it was, okay, fine, no problem. Then it was, well, do y'all think you can cut it back to 90 minutes? And then it was, do y'all think you can cut it back to an hour? And then it, literally, this is what happened. You know, they, and they, they were allowing us to meet there just out of compassion for what the town had done to us or the city had done to us. So finally, long story short, uh, it was like they wanted us basically walk in, say amen and walk out. And I got so frustrated and aggravated, and I had some uh, somebody in Atlanta who was uh, begging me to come down to Atlanta and start a work. And I told the guys in Connecticut, I said, I, I just don't, and, and believe me, to be honest, I feel like I, I missed the Lord on this one. I really did. It was, but I had gone through that sickness I've talked about, nearly dying and everything, and that whole year that I was in Connecticut, you know, year and a half was just a horrible, 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 horrible year. And so anyway, I wound up deciding I'm just going to go to Atlanta and try to do something in Atlanta. Went to Atlanta. I have never been through. I've never been through the hell in my life that I went through in Atlanta. I, I mean, I'm not joking. I lived out of my car. I literally arrived in Atlanta. I had just spoken to the man who said, if you'll come, I can give you a place to stay and, you know, you can establish the church and find your own place and everything, but I'll give you a place to stay in the interim and all this. I had just talked to him like days before leaving to go down there, had my car full of clothes and packed and, you know, uh, put all my stuff in storage and everything. I get to Atlanta, I get to the man's house and the guy says, Oh, well, you know, I just started a new relationship, so I'm not going to be able to do this after all. Here I was on disability income, used every penny I had to make the trip. I was going to be broke for a month. And uh, I, I wasn't going to have another dime to my name for a month. And so I wound up living out of my car. And folks, when I tell you I went hungry, I don't mean I went hungry for a day or two. I mean, I went hungry. You didn't see me out begging. You didn't see me out, you know, begging on the streets and stuff. Honestly, there was one LGBT uh, bar there in town that uh, I forget what day of the week it was or what days of the week. But, you know, on certain dates, they would put out food you know, and they, they had a, a program. I, for, I forget what all it was. But anyway, they, you know, they put out finger foods and stuff. And literally, that's all I had to eat. That, that's the only way I could even eat. And uh, I got to know a, a drag performer who used to head up a gospel program in Atlanta on Sundays at a local LGBT bar. And uh, she'd invite me to come and sing during the program. And while they had uh, drag performers, you know, who would, who would lip sync to stuff, gospel music, all gospel, the whole program was gospel, um, I would bring soundtracks and then I would be included in the program and I would sing uh, gospel songs that I sing. And um, tears, oh, that, that place would be packed on Sunday, absolutely packed. And tears were streaming down people's faces and it was just something to see. And I'd always have people coming to me, where's your church at? Blah, 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 blah. And I had literally used my money, my disability money, to um, rent a meeting room in a local motel. That's part of the reason I was broke. Um, I had rented a meeting room out for like a, the first month or whatever. And so I would tell them, well, we're going to be meeting at this motel in this meeting room, you know, blah, blah, blah. And folks, I'm telling you, not a soul, not one soul showed up for our meetings in Atlanta. Always had people ask, me, oh, they acted interested. You know, oh, where are you at? Where's your church? But they never showed up. Not a soul showed up. 
And uh, I went through absolute hell. I wound up living out of my car for nearly a month and a half. Nobody would offer me any help. Nobody would offer me a place to stay. Nobody would offer me a bite to eat. Nothing. Uh, I had a couple people who offered me a place to stay, and they made it conditional if I was willing to, you know, offer favors. And I said, no, I don't play that. I said, I'm a man of integrity. I believe in what I believe in. I said, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not paying for a place to stay with sexual favors or any other kind of favors. I said, I don't play that. So I stayed in my car. And um, I was there. It was the hottest part of the year. And if you, if you know anything about Atlanta, man, whew, Atlanta gets hot. Holy mackerel, it gets hot. And um, so anyway, I wound up there, you know, basically about six months and it was painfully obvious that there was there was no way Atlanta there was no, they just weren't even the remotely interested in my ministry. So when my mother invited me to Dallas in uh, 2001, uh, I'd been out of the hospital after nearly dying. I'd been out for about a year or so, and change uh, was after 9/11. 9/11 happened on. Uh, uh, in uh, September of 2001 and a couple months later I was in Atlanta and my mother said would you like to, would you be willing to come to Texas she lived about an hour east of Dallas at that time she said would you like to come to Texas for Christmas you know I said mom I'd love to I'd love to be there with you and my brother and his wife and you know all that I said but I can't afford to fly out there there's no way and she said, well, I can't afford to fly you, but if I sent you the gas money, could you drive, you know? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll drive it because I had a car. So I drove that year to Texas um, for Christmas is really what I had come for. And I was going to go back to Atlanta, to be honest with you. I was going to, even though nothing was happening in Atlanta, by then I had finally been able to rent a place, you know, and stuff. And so... Uh, I was going to go back to Atlanta, and uh, I came out here, and while I was here, a friend of mine on Facebook asked me if I'd come into Dallas and um, and uh, play pool, because I love to play pool, and he knew from my online, you know, things that I love to play pool, and so he said, would you come into Dallas and play some pool with me? I said, oh, I'd love to. You know, and, and he and I hadn't met. We were just knowing each other through Facebook or whatever it was. Or it might have been MySpace back then. I'm not sure I was on Facebook back then. But anyway, so I went to this place, that a, a bar, an LGBT bar in Dallas that he recommended. It has three pool tables, and that's all I'm there for. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. So I, I was just there for pool. I wanted to play pool. Well, he never showed up. And in the meantime, I met Tommy that night. And uh, the rest is history. 21 years later, we're still together, you know, uh, six years after being legally married in 2015. And that was the night that I met Tommy. So the Lord used that man and him inviting me to come to Dallas to play pool. The Lord used him because I wouldn't have been in Dallas that night if that fellow hadn't invited me to come to Dallas and play pool. And uh, I came to Dallas, and Tommy and I spent some time to either got to know each other, and, and we started seeing each other. And then, uh, you know, I had explained to him my reasons for why I never moved to Dallas uh, before this or anything, because I told him, I said, do you know... When I was in New York City and I was thinking about leaving New York City and praying about leaving New York City, even before I went to Connecticut, my home state, I felt like the Lord spoke to me about Dallas. I said, but the only way I could move to Dallas was I would have to stay at my mom's house for a while and then try to get established in Dallas, you know, and... Uh, I said, I, I can't do that. I'm not going to go into any reasons or anything, but I said, I can't do that. There's no way in the universe I can do that. So I wound up doing Connecticut and, you know, and then Atlanta instead. And, blah, blah. and anyway, so while I was in Dallas and everything, you know, um, Tommy and I got to know each other. Then we 
exchanged addresses and phone numbers, and I was literally going to drive back to uh, to uh, Atlanta. I was driving back to Atlanta, and I had not even gotten to Tyler, Texas, which is about two hours from Dallas, and about an hour from where my mother was living at that time. And uh, I hadn't even gotten to Tyler, and my car started to buck like a Bronco, literally just started bucking. And I'm going like this, you know, and and I couldn't get it to stop. I'd stop, I'd start going again. It kept doing this stuff. And my brother is a mechanic, so I called my brother. I said, Michael, you know, this car's going crazy. I don't know what's going on. He said, don't worry. He said, I'm coming out with a truck, and we'll get you and bring you back. To mom so he went he came and got me brought me back to my mother's place he said I'll take a look at it and see what the deal is blah 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 well he came back and told me he said Chuck I hate to tell you but I think your trans uh, axle is it's a front-wheel drive car so I think your transaxle is bad and so um, he said that it's gonna need to be replaced and I thought oh dear Jesus how in the world am I gonna do this because I don't have the money for I, I'm on disability at the time. I think if I was blessed, I was getting uh, $600 a month if I was blessed. And I said, how in the world am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? So I told Tommy, I said, I have to stay in Dallas. I mean, I have to stay in the area for about another month or so before I can even go back to Atlanta because even if I leave my car, I don't have the money to fly back to Atlanta. Uh, I, I'm going to have to stay here a month before I can even go back to Atlanta, you know. Blah, blah. And Tommy said, well, you know, I know you prefer not to stay at your mom's. He said, if you'd like to stay here in Dallas, you know, so long, sir, sir, I come to Dallas. And I said, you know what, since I'm going to be here for a month anyway, I said, let me start investigating and seeing what the possibility might be for starting a work in Dallas, because I thought about coming here years ago. Atlanta's not working. There's no way in the world Atlanta's working. Connecticut might have worked if I'd have stuck with it, to be honest with you. But having just gotten out of the hospital and going through everything I went through, uh, for some reason, I, I went through a period where... where uh, I really wasn't thinking altogether clearly for one thing, because that whole hospitalization and nearly dying and everything, I really went through kind of a PTSD experience, you know, and I got real frustrated with the the the, the meeting space being pulled out of underneath us by the city and and the Episcopal Church, you know, shortening up, shortening up, shortening up our time. And so anyway, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, folks, every decision I've ever made was the right one or a good one. Um, but it's just, it's, it is what it is. Okay. You know, I've told you, anybody that knows me knows I've said it a thousand times. I'm as transparent as a piece of glass. I don't try to hide. I don't try to act like I'm something I'm not. I don't try to act like I'm perfect. I don't try to act like every decision I've ever made was the best decision in the world because that's not true of anybody. And anybody that acts like that is an idiot. Because that is, there's not a person on this planet, aside from Jesus, who can make every decision a perfect decision, and every thought a perfect thought, and every move a perfect move. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't do that. I don't play that. I try to be honest with people. And so long story short, you know the story. I wound up coming to Dallas. We, we moved to Dallas. Tommy helped me move to Dallas. I told him when I met him, I said... I don't believe in meet today and marry tomorrow. I said, I, I don't move in with people overnight. But him knowing that I really didn't want to stay at my mother's house for months on end, trying to get established in Dallas, he said, well, you can stay with me until you can find a place. I gave him an absolute deadline. I said, it'll take me no more than 90 days. Well, within 90 days, I had an apartment of my own. It was just up the road from him. It wasn't very far from him. But I had my own apartment, and I was all set up, and I was going along. He and I lived apart, folks. We lived in separate apartments for the first eight years, eight years of our relationship. 
And a lot of the reason for that is, to be honest with you, from my standpoint anyway, Tommy's probably wishing we still lived apart. But from my vantage point anyway, um, there were issues that we had that I felt were best addressed with us not living together. You know, it made more sense. And I'm going to tell you something. I wish people would, I wish people would think with their heads instead of, you know, with body parts, because um, a lot of times, if you'll give your relationship enough time, and if you'll if you'll approach it living apart like that, you know, then you can you can go through a lot of stuff, and you can work out a lot of stuff where. He's able to go back to his neutral space. I'm able to go back to my neutral corner, so to speak, kind of like a boxing match, you know. And then you think about things and you work things out in your mind. Then you come back to the, I don't know how many times he and I had little tiffs and arguments and stuff. I mean, I'd get aggravated when he gets aggravated with me. Then he'd go back to his apartment. I'd go back, you know, I'd be there at mine. And then uh, the next day we'd get together. And we'd start talking about what we had gone through and what we were arguing about or whatever. And he'd say, well, you know, I was thinking about it while I was at home. And I'd say, well, I was thinking about, it. you know, and we were able to work through a lot of stuff. Had we been living together and not been able to go to our separate corners, so to speak, I guarantee you that relationship would have ended. It would have gone down in flames. I guarantee it. But for the first eight years, we gave it time. I mean, we were constantly together. You know, we were constantly together. Uh, we were either, either in his place or mine. But if we needed to, you know, go to our to our own neutral corner, we could do that. And so it really worked out for us. And then finally, at one point, uh, I had some money uh, come to me, and. Uh, of my own, didn't have anything to do with, you know, the church or anything. And uh, I told Tommy, I said, you know what? I said, I think maybe it's time for us to go ahead and make the move and get together. I said, but let's buy a house. Instead of moving in together in an apartment somewhere, I said, I've got the money for a down payment on a house. So let's buy a house. So that's what we did. We bought our first house together in Dallas. All right, I'm not going to bore you with endless hours of yakking about all this. Um, Tommy and I went today to a local Church of God in Christ, affectionately known as Kojic, C-O-G-I-C, uh, here in um, Huntsville. Um, I have had, over the many years I've been in ministry, when I was pastoring in the Church of God out of Cleveland, Tennessee, Kojic and Church of God were kind of like sister organizations, and they often did cooperative things together. And um, uh, over the years in my early ministry, I preached in many, many, many Kojic churches. I got to know a lot of Kojic pastors and things and had very good fellowship with them. And even after I came into the apostolic movement, I have always maintained a good fellowship with Church of God in Christ, uh, churches and all, and people. So this morning I told Tommy, I said, I want to go to church somewhere. Last night, I, or the, even the day before anyway, I told Tommy, maybe within the last day or so, I said, I want to go to church Sunday. I said, but I'm sure enough not going to go um I'm not going to go to a white evangelical church because they're Trump worshipers and I'm not going to have that foolishness. I'm not going to sit there and put up with that foolishness. So instead of going to a to a white evangelical church today, I said, let's just find a Kojic. Well, it turns out there was one uh, just a couple of miles from our hotel. So we went there this morning. It's a very small uh, church of God in Christ. And... Um, one thing that's interesting about Church of God in Christ, they are a Trinity organization, but they are real strong on the divinity of Christ. They are, 
they have an enormous emphasis. That's why the name of the church is Church of God in Christ, you know. They're extremely strong on the divinity of Christ's uh, doctrine, you know, an aspect. So anyway, so I said, well, let's go there this morning and vis visit. I saw online that it was a very small church. And I said, well, it doesn't matter. I don't care how small or big it is. You know, I said, I just want to go to church and be in the house of God today. So we went and visited there this morning. The pastor invited me up on the platform, and at one point in the service, <clears throat> he gave me room. He said, brother, come share a word, you know. And so I did, and I tried to keep it brief and uh, relatively. <laughs> and uh, I told Tommy, I said, if the pastor gives me space, I said, please go ahead and use your phone and videotape it. I said, that way we can share that with people today. Since we're not having a church service today, we can share that with them anyway, and that'll kind of compensate for church a little bit. And so he did tape it. Now, it's been uploading from his phone and taken forever. That's why I didn't share that at 3 o'clock on the nose. And that's part of the reason why I didn't get started till a little bit after 3 myself. I was trying to get that video going where I could share it with you all at 3 o'clock on the money. Uh, didn't happen. But I will be sharing that shortly. And I hope you'll take the time to watch it. Bear in mind, when I go into a mainstream church... Um, I am not, I won't lie, you know, I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to be like that, but obviously for reasons you can know, you can imagine, um, I do try to approach things with wisdom, okay, I'm not trying to create a conflict for that pastor, I'm not trying to create a conflict for that church, I'm a Christian, I know I have a place at the table. Um, if they know my whole life story, my whole situation, they may not think I have a place at the table, but I know I do. And so, you know, I'm kind of very careful about what information we share and, and how we say things and what have you. So you may notice in the video, you know, things are spoken of in certain ways. And, and the way they saw, I think they referred to Tommy as what, my associate. They would say my associate, and I didn't correct them. You know, I just let that go. Uh, but just understand, I'm trying to use wisdom, okay? You've got to be careful because I'm trying to build bridges. I'm not trying to uh, create conflict and, and confusion. I'm trying to build bridges. And when our ministry moves here and everything, and, and they're going to know good and well who I am, I'm sure, um, I want them to be able to look back at today and say, well, you know what? That man came into our church, and my God, he gave a word. The pastor was thrilled with it, absolutely thrilled with it. And he told me, he said, brother, he said, I hadn't told you nothing about our church. He said, and by God, you come in. He said, and some of the things you said were right on the money, exactly what what people watching online needed to hear because they also broadcast their services on Facebook and what have you. So he said, thank you. He said, man, you really, really gave a wonderful word today. I hope it was. I'm not saying that of myself, please. But I hope it was a blessing to them and an encouragement to them. And uh, I'm going to share that video with you very shortly, hopefully within the next, you know, 30 minutes or so roughly, okay? And uh, I'll share that. And I hope it'll be equally a blessing to you. I will tell you, you might have to turn the volume up on your laptop or your phone or your smart TV, however you watch it. Uh, the building did have a good echo and, you know, kind of bad acoustics. So um, in order to hear it clearly, you know, you might have to turn your volume up a little bit or something. Okay, so be forewarned. All right. I'm just going to pray a prayer as we close, all right? And if you'll pray with me, I'd be grateful, and then I'll let you go, and I'll get that video prepared to share with you shortly. Father, we love you, God. We thank you, Master, for today. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship of these kind people at this local church. We thank you for the opportunity to have been in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, that there are people who love you. They may not know everything about you that they need to know, but they love you, Lord. They do the best they can with the light they have. And, Lord, I thank you for allowing us to have the wisdom 
to approach people in such a manner uh, as to love them and embrace them. Because if they're to come into the kingdom, we cannot be offensive, we cannot be hurtful, we cannot be judgmental, we cannot be critical. But we have to approach things in love with grace. And I thank you, Lord, for giving us the wisdom to understand this. Today, Lord, has been an amazing day. Oh, glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, today has been an amazing day. You've allowed, God, the offer that we made to be met at, at the exact price we were hoping for. The exact, not one dime more, not one dime less, but exactly where we wanted it, Lord. And you're allowing us the property that from the first minute that I laid eyes on it, online. I knew, I knew in my spirit, I told Tommy, I know this is the place. I just have a feeling. And it was the last place we looked at, but it was the first place I wanted to see. And Jesus, I feel so blessed. My heart is overflowing. I can't even express the gratitude and the appreciation that I feel. Oh God, you're opening a door for us to be in an environment that is peaceful, that is tranquil. Lord, an environment that should be a great blessing to our soul, that'll be a blessing to our fur babies. Lord, that'll be a blessing to Tommy as he gets to come home from work and, and be out of the hustle and bustle of a city environment without a neighbor uh, crawling up your backside to annoy and frustrate. And Lord, I'm just so grateful today. I can't even express. My heart is just bursting with gratitude and appreciation. We thank you, God, for every person online, every individual, Lord, who uh, there are so many of our extended members around the world and around the country, people who have been watching our ministry and participating, not just watching, but participating in our ministry through the internet for many, many years. Amy and Marvin and uh, Brendan and uh, Adam and Cynthia and Scott. And my God, I could, get, I could get down the list. There's so many. But all these people, Lord, uh, who have been part of our church, and we consider them members of our church, even though they don't live locally. And we thank you, God, for every one of these people. I ask God that every extended member of this church, those we have, those in England, we have some Lord in uh, as far away as the Far East, you know, uh, Japan and China. There are people, Lord, who have been watching our work for many years in Russia, uh, Ireland, I mean, all over the globe, Australia. And we just ask God right now that you would bless each and every person who has been a blessing to this work, who has been supportive of this work, open doors for them. Lord, let the blessing of God be poured out upon their head until they cannot even receive it. Let the windows of heaven be open in the name of Jesus upon their lives. Bless them, Lord, with good jobs. Bless them with divine favor. Let them, Lord, uh, receive reward for their good work and their diligence. We're not asking you, Lord, to give them anything they don't deserve, but we are asking you to allow them to receive everything in response to that which they do deserve. Because we know so often people work so hard and yet they're not recognized, they're not appreciated, they're not rewarded for the good work they do. But these are God's people. And we ask, Lord, that you would give them favor in the eyes of their employers, their bosses, their teachers, if they're in school, Lord, where, uh, their communities, give them favor so that their work will be rewarded and they will not be robbed in any way of any advancement, of any increase in pay. Lord, whatever the case might be, return unto them hundredfold that which they have given in support of this ministry all these years as we have struggled to continue, O oh God, to do the work you've called us to do, to try with all our might to be a blessing to the LGBT community and, and, and 
those who, while they are not LGBT, they fully appreciate and love this ministry. And there are many. Master, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, oh God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for the opportunity to share with our friends right now online. And we ask all this today in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God and amen. All right, friends, I'm going to let you go for now. Keep an eye open. I'll be sharing that video very, very shortly. As soon as I'm able, I'll have it up and available for you to watch, okay? God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.